So we're going to continue now with our study of Book Two of the Republic, and this time I want to look at the character Adamantus, Glaucon's brother. Adamantus comes on the scene at 362D, right after Glaucon has basically issued his challenge to Socrates. He's asked Socrates to defend the idea that the just life is better than the unjust life after giving a, an account of the things people say that suggest the opposite. And Socrates says at 362d, When Glaucon had said this, I had it in mind to say something to it. But his brother Adamantus said in his turn, You surely don't believe, Socrates, that the argument has been adequately stated. Um, so Socrates was about to talk, and Adamantus interrupts the conversation. So Socrates said, I had in mind to say something to this. You know what? You're never going to find out what Socrates was going to say because Adamantus interrupted. So that's the first thing to remember, right? Socrates says there was a response to make here, but you don't get it. Instead, what you get is Adamantus saying this. And he says, you surely don't believe, Socrates, that the argument has been adequately stated. And I said, why not? And Adamantus said, well, what most needed to be said has not been said. Then I said, as the saying goes, let a man stand by his brother. Right, so uh, Adamantus is claiming that he's basically going to be presenting a version of the same thing that Glaucon presented. Right? He's saying, oh, I'm, I'm making that same argument, but Glaucon didn't say it well enough, I'm going to say it well enough. Well, yeah, of course, you have to ask yourself that, too. You have to ask if he's right. You have to ask if the thing he ends up presenting really is the same as the thing Glaucon presented. And you have to ask if both of those are really the same as what Thrasymachus presented. I mean, at a certain level, uh, I think, yeah, they reflect a similar kind of position. And yet each one is a, is a kind of a unique way of construing and setting up the argument. And what it takes to respond to one well uh, isn't always the same as what it takes to respond to the other one well. Like They really operate with different kinds of terms and different approaches. So it's important to hold in your own mind the uh, sort of integrity of each of these different accounts and think about what it would take to respond well to them. And as I said, Socrates says, I was going to say something to Glaucon, but ah, let's go on to this next thing instead. So that's the first thing I want to say. But I also want to then pick up a little bit more on, on um, Adamantus's remark that what most needed to be said has not been said. Uh, again, you know, I'm trying to draw your attention to the structure of this as a piece of writing and as a dialogue. And that remark by Adamantus uh, makes that point, too, from a different angle, right? You have to remember at any point that these are people engaged in an argument. And there's no guarantee when any two people are engaged in an argument that they do it perfectly. Right? And so your job as a reader is always to be asking, is what needed to be said actually being said? And that's true both from the side of the challenges and from the side of the responses. So uh, whether or not Adamantus is right here, that he is uh, supplying the essential corrective or completion to the argument, it remains the case that that's a question uh, a reader always has to be asking in, in engaging with these arguments. Um, and then I want to note uh, another thing after that before getting into the real heart of this, which is what he says. But I want to note something else from the beginning here. He says, we must also go through the arguments opposed to those of which he spoke, those that praise justice and blame injustice. It's an interesting thing he does here. He says, uh, Glaucon gave you all the arguments that are given in favor of injustice, but what we haven't done is heard the counter-arguments, the ones that praise justice. He's going to claim that they're not very good. But the thing that's interesting to me is just the structure of that. That very much resembles the method that Socrates says he learned from Parmenides in the dialogue Parmenides, where Parmenides says, you know, it's never enough just to take up an argument from one side, like just look at the argument against something, for example, to, to try to conclude if it's compelling. You also have to take up the argument from the other side, in this case, the argument for something, to see if it's compelling or, or uncompelling. So, you know, it sh you would imagine it's going to be the case that if the argument on one side is compelling, the argument on the other side isn't. But you can get into a situation where the argument on each side seems equally compelling. And this is the structure behind uh, the sort of antinomial arguments of the skeptics from ancient philosophy and continuing through figures like Kant and so on. So that method from Parmenides is independently important in philosophy. Uh, I note only here that Adamantus is doing a version of that, which again, uh, just, just as Glaucon very much sort of resembles Socrates' method in his way of speaking, 
again, here it suggests that Adamantus is well-schooled in these sorts of things. Uh, now let's look at what he actually says. And I want to begin by saying this. Like, remember, he's going to talk about the arguments that praise, um, praise justice. And he says, No doubt fathers say to their sons and exhort them, as do all those who have care of anyone, that one must be just. So that's what he's going to go on now and look at, the way that people praise justice. Um, and there, I want you to begin by noticing he says, fathers say this to their sons. So we're reminded again of that structure of fathers and sons that was you know, at the core of book one. Um, and it alerts us to think about what happens in the household right? and how are stories and ideals and values transmitted. And so now we're going to look at those stories that fathers tell to their sons. <laughs> Adamantus says basically three big things between 363a and 365a. Uh, he says, first of all, his basic complaint is this, is that though fathers say to their sons that they should be just, he says, uh, however, they don't praise justice by itself, but the good reputations that come from it. So basically what he's going to say is uh, justice is never uh, taken, is never presented as something inherently valuable in its own right. But something else is said. And let me just skip ahead to the end of his speech, 366E and 367A. He says, he's, he's complaining, you know, nobody ever praises justice on its own. But he says, if all of you had spoken in this way from the beginning and persuaded us from youth onwards, we would not keep guard over each other for fear and justice be done, but each would be his own best guard, afraid that in doing injustice he would dwell with the greatest evil. Um, so I just want to point that at the end. He's saying, People could have been raised to think about justice as a kind of inherent good and have uh, learned to care about that. But that's not what actually happens, that justice is instead praised for certain consequences and so on. Anyway, the thing he says is uh, three particular things about that. So in the first part, he says it's all about getting a good reputation. If you have a good reputation for justice, you're going to get a good marriage and hold high office and so on. And then he says also, you know, you want to get a good reputation with the gods. That's what the gods care about. And then he, he quotes uh, Homer and Hesiod about this and so on. And he says, you know, the stories we're told say it, it matters that the gods think you're this way or that. He says, uh, in the in the poetry of uh, Musaeus and his son, he says, uh, in their speech, they lead them into Hades and lay them down on couches. Crowning them, they prepare a symposium of the holy, and they then make them go through the rest of time drunk in the belief that the finest wage of virtue is an eternal drunk. And then uh, a little bit later, he says, um, and in turn, they bury the unholy and unjust in mud and Hades and compel them to carry water in a sieve. And they have nothing uh, else to say. This then is the praise and blame attached to them. So the, basically, the, the point there is, he says, you know, you get stories about uh, what's going to happen if you're just or not, or specifically if you have a reputation for being just or not. And the idea is, you know, you're going to go to Hades and you're either going to get a prize or you're going to get a punishment. Right? You get There's a story, in other words, that's told about the afterlife and the awarding of prizes. And that is what is presented as the reason for being just or not, or at least for having a reputation of being just or not. Uh, and then he says, then people talk about virtue and vice, and they say the road of virtue is hard, the road of vice is easy, right? And so picking up again on the sorts of themes that Glaucon was bringing up. And here, indeed, as I, as I mentioned before, this really sounds like the um, sort of models of virtue and vice that come up in Prodicus's choice of Heracles. But anyway, he says that's the other thing that these storytellers say. That's the, really the second big point. And then the third one uh, starts at 363b and, and carries on uh, to 365a. And he says here, the most wonderful of all those speeches are those they give about gods and virtue because they say that the gods, after all, a lot misfortune and a bad life to many good men and an opposite fate to opposite men. So he's saying, you know, these stories make it sound like the gods do things unjustly. They don't actually match up the prize to the proper person, not on the basis of who's actually good or bad. And then that leads into uh, beggar priests and diviners who go to the doors of rich men and persuade them that the gods have provided them with a power based on sacrifice and an incantation. They say they can persuade the gods to serve them. So in other words, uh, a further story is, well, uh, 
you know, if you say the right prayers or if you do the right rituals or whatever, if you do the right things, that's going to be what gets you the favor of the gods. Right? So that's his, his third complaint is that the gods themselves are presented as in a way being able to be persuaded and to be basically be persuaded by bribes. So once again, the issue is not whether you're truly just, it's whether you go through these routines that supply the proper currency, the proper money basically, to buy a prize in the afterlife. So these are his complaints about the way justice is talked about, about the way that people when they're growing up are being encouraged to choose to be just or to have a reputation for justice and he's saying yes you know fathers tell their sons this but they do it by telling them these stories the stories from homer and hesiod and so on these stories uh, repeat these versions of what justice is and what the gods are uh, that as he says basically really misrepresent the nature of the good so that instead of presenting it as something of inherent value it's something instrumentally to be used to to buy an eternal drunk instead of having to carry water in a sieve right something like that um and i want to just uh, add one more note before going back and just talking about that a little bit and that is right at the end 364a he says you know uh, the result of this is that you know if you that as he said they go to persuade the rich and you know the rich people are gonna um be able to do these things and he says those who who didn't sacrifice for those people terrible things are going to be waiting right so it sounds like th these people are saying you know if you can do do these things which cost money uh, that's going to buy you into heaven and people who can't afford to do that they're they're not going to be you know get the good prize right the thing i just want you to remember there is how much that sounds like kephalus right? how much it sounds like kephalus who is buying a stairway to heaven with his uh, sacrifices that he can pay for uh and and indeed, that's the point I really want you to think about now is, is again, Kephalus in particular. I want you to think about how much the relationship to these stories and what they putatively tell that Adamantus presents here sounds like exactly what Kephalus himself described back in book one. <laughs> So if you remember back in book one, you know, Kephalus said, you know, there are these stories, you know, we all used to laugh at as kids about the afterlife, you know, you get prizes or you get punishments. But now, and now that I'm getting older, I start to take those things seriously. So it seems to me that Kephalus got out of those stories pretty much exactly what Adamantus says people get out of those stories. But as I said at the time, um, I, I don't... I'm not inclined to think that Kephalus's relationship to those stories is is very profound, uh, and I guess I would have to say the same thing about Adamantus. Uh, I I I think yeah, it makes sense that you would say this. How could you not notice this about traditional religious stories that are told all over the place? Of course, that's true. Um, but is that the most profound response to those stories? I don't think so. So I'll come back later to what it seems to me Socrates. Uh, responses. But before that, I want to just think a little bit more about these stories and think, okay, what are these stories? How do they work? Um, and so, you know, another thing to notice is that throughout this, you know, they're talking about the stories that you hear from the poets, right? So they're taking the poetry as a kind of object and looking at it and they're saying, look, here's what it says. But the poetry also functions with these people in a different way, right? It also just comes out of them. They speak through it. So it's very, very common for Adamantus and Glaucon or earlier Paul and Marcus, just to quote the poets. You know, they, they say, you know, they're going to make a po point and they say, well, it's like Bacchylides says, or like Pindar says, or like Simonides says. Right, you'll recall that Paul and Marcus uh, in book one began by saying, well, if we believe Simonides, blah, 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 you know, you got to do what's owing to the to the person. And that Paul and Marcus's discussion with Socrates began as a, as a kind of interpretation of the Simonides quotation. Here, Adamantus also quotes uh, Simonides at one place, uh, Pindar is quoted repeatedly, um, and indeed uh, Kephalus uh, similarly referred to Pindar right in that very speech that I was just referring to when he talks about the afterlife and so on. So you can see through the behavior of these people that poetry has a kind of living force in them in the way it structures their thinking and their speaking, right? It's become in a way the lens by which they've been able to make sense of a lot of things.
Um, that's not, in principle, incompatible with the claim that Adamantus is making about what kind of lens they offer. But, but I'm, my point is really just to notice that difference, the difference between taking the poem as an object, where you say, oh, I look at this and here, I think it means this and so on, versus the poetry as some, almost like a kind of organ of thinking or speaking that these people give evidence of right, in, the, in the way they behave. Um, so, so I want to think about those poems too now. So these guys, they, as I said, they quote Bacchylides, uh, Pindar, Simonides, those kinds of guys a lot. But these are the poets who are writing these praise poems for Olympic victors and so on, right there. That is a distinctly uh, aristocratic form of poetry. They're poems celebrating Olympic victors who are rich aristocrats going out and racing. And they're poems about the Greek heroes who are themselves all aristocrats. Right? These, that poetry uh, is the part of the aristocratic education of these very wealthy aristocratic kids. And it, it, it is also about the, the kind of ideal of the aristocratic interpretation of the person, something like that. Socrates himself, uh, I haven't done a systematic study of this by any means, but but just thinking about how he talks in these books, he cites Homer and Hesiod a lot. Uh, and that's a, a somewhat different poetic tradition, right? That's the, the epic tradition. You know, Pindar, Bacchylides, Simonides, they're real people who wrote individual poems. Homer isn't a person. Homer is a name of an oral tradition. Right? And so the Iliad, the Odyssey, are poems that are handed down by a culture to itself. Uh, a poetry by which that culture kind of talks about and defines itself. Uh, but there's no, there's no person who ever exactly wrote it, right? And that's the tradition, that epic tradition is the one that uh, Socrates draws on. And uh, there, uh, that may be aristocratic too, but, my, uh, but it's, it's a little bit different. And I mean, and Socrates may draw on those others too. Uh, he certainly seems to know that stuff. Uh, but it just seems to me that he tends to cite those, those epic things. They also quote the tragic poets a bit, uh, Seven Against Thebes by Aeschylus was uh, just mentioned, I think, in the conversation with Glaucon. And they mentioned Sophocles uh, back in the beginning when, when um, Cephalus was talking about his friends and so on. So the tragic poets come up. Tragedy is a poetic genre of, I think, of the democratic city. Right? It's, a, it's a different kind of genre than those other ones because in, in uh, tragic poetry, uh, the those great families of those more traditional stories are shown in a way to be dysfunctional. Tragedy tends to portray the city in contrast to the family and shows the problem inherent to those aristocratic families. So it seems much more like a genre of the self-governing polis as opposed to the poetry of the elite aristocracy. Comedy uh, uh, would be like that too, Comedy is even more striking because in, in comedy, the central characters are low figures. They're not these high heroes, these arist great aristocrats from the past. You know, they're, they're like the little Athenian guy. Um, that's who, how the story is played out. But those low figures are um, they're not exactly heroic. They're kind of the opposite. They're figures with really petty concerns. And, and uh, so they're often as much subject to criticism as they are, uh, as the... Uh, great aristic families are sort of subject to criticism in the tragic dramas. Uh, but I want to know one further thing, right? There's a new genre of literature, too. It's the one you're reading when you're reading The Republic. But the very interesting thing that Plato has done is is introduce something that's very much like tragedy and comedy. You know, it's a dialogue. It's, it's the portrayal of people in conversation rather than a narrator telling you a story, right? as, a tragic, tra as tragedies and comedies are. But in here, something like that low person, right, a non-aristocrat, Socrates, this poor guy, is actually the hero. And so you have a, a, a kind of radically new literary genre here being presented to you. Um, in, in, I mean, you're actually reading it. So, so what I want you to think about here is poetry in its sort of cultural role. Right? What, you, what you see when you see Glaucon and Adamantus quoting Pindar and so on is that this is the medium by which people got educated. You know, as Adamantus says, yeah, fathers do tell sons, do tell stories to their sons, right? They get them to read the poems and so on. It's through these things that people are getting their education. So, 
these so poetry you know isn't just a nice object to look at it's it's school right and it's the backbone of the aristocratic education anyway and then I wanted you to think a little bit about the poetry that they're reading. So yes, you know, certainly is has stories, and Adamantus is giving his view about what those stories tell you. But I want also just to think a little bit more about the genres of those poetry, and just very quickly talk about uh, the epic, the lyric, uh, the, the praise poetry, Epinician poetry, victory, victory odes, um, tragedy and comedy, and so on, to remind you to think about the political significance of these different genres and how you know they're not just little stories they're also um, they're also kind of vehicles for presenting the values of a whole political approach and and, and in that context to think about what's really happening with the distinctive kind of literature that Plato is, is creating um, so I wanted to bring that up because I wanted to say, well, maybe, you know, if you think about genre, that's a little bit different than thinking about plot. And you may see a different way that these things have an effect. Near the end of that, at 365E, he says something interesting. He says, you know, he says somebody might say, uh, if there are no gods or if they have no care for human beings, why should we care uh, about getting away? Right. You might you might not believe in the gods and then he says and if there are gods and they care we know of them or have heard of them from nowhere else than the laws and the poets who have given genealogies um, and that's what told us to uh, buy them off with sacrifices right so he's saying you know here here are the lessons somebody's going to draw from this but uh, but that line is very interesting he says uh, we know of them, the gods, or have heard of them from nowhere else than the laws and the poets who have given genealogies. So I want you to think about that idea. Like, ask yourself the question, you know, where does anybody know about God from? And he's saying something here, I think, pretty powerful about um, about the domain we would normally call religion, right? That, that in a significant way, Religions are inherited. They're inherited views and values that are handed down through stories, through literature, and so on. With that in mind, I want to look at one thing that Socrates says in the Apology to remember something Socrates told you about his view about this. So remember from the Apology that Socrates tells you that he basically devoted his life to responding to the oracle at Delphi, who said no one was wiser than Socrates. Right? So why did that happen? Well, the oracle said something that, on the face of it, didn't make any sense to him. Because he says, like, I'm not wise, right? But, but what does he say about that? He said, when I heard these words, I pondered them like this. Whatever is the god saying? And what riddle is he posing? For I am conscious that I am not at all wise, either much or little. But surely he is not saying something false, at least. For that is not sanctioned for him. That quotation I, I, seems to me is very important because Socrates is saying, on the one hand, this thing didn't fit with my experience. But so I had to ask, is it a kind of a riddle? And you remember that's what he said about the Simonides line, right? That poets speak in a riddling fashion and so on, and he had to work then to interpret it, right? Well, and the thing he says here, why, why does he say that? Because he says here, uh, surely he, the god, is not saying something false at least, for that is not sanctioned for him. Right, so Socrates' response to this kind of remark from the oracle or whatever is that it's kind of given that it's true. And so the challenge is to figure out how it is true. And in particular, it's a, it's a challenge that um, takes his own self-interpretation. I am not wise. And, and so in a certain way says no to that. Right, so the way he responds to these things is that uh, the, well, to the oracle, right, is that it is the kind of remark that you know to be true. You, basically, you know it to be wise. It is wisdom coming at you. But it's wisdom that forces you to transform your your ways of making sense of things and to transform your sense of yourself. And it became the basis for his lifelong path. Right? So I wanted to point to that remark from Socrates, which is very reminiscent of... 
how he responded to the line from Simonides in Book One of the Republic. I wanted to point to that as a kind of key to what you might call Socrates' hermeneutical method, right? His way of interpreting religious texts or uh, wisdom, inspired wisdom or something like that. And think about that in contrast to the way Adamantus is, is taking up these kinds of stories and ways that the views about the gods have been handed down, and in contrast to uh, how Kephlas similarly took, it up, uh, took them up in book one. <laughs> After that initial speech by Adamantus, Socrates does come in and he gives his response to Adamantus and Glaucon, and then he starts giving an account of where the city comes from, and then you'll remember that Glaucon interrupts and says, I want to talk about a city like the city nowadays, and so they drop the kind of account Socrates was giving and launch into this new one. And that uh, leads to the discussion of the issue of the guardians, the idea that one of the needs a city has is to have have the function of guarding taken care of. Uh, and that initially is interpreted in relationship to an army, the military. Later, by the end of book three, you see that that role gets interpreted differently. And, and it, by the end of book five, it gets interpreted a bit differently again. But initially, it's sort of military role. And you'll recall that Socrates raised a question there. Like he said, you know, what do you need to be to be a good guardian in the sense of a soldier? And he said, look, if you think of what it takes to be a good guardian, in certain ways that's actually at odds in principle with being a good guardian, right? That there's something kind of impossible or contradictory built into that role. So they they look at that situation and say, well, how are we going to deal with it? Because Socrates says, doesn't that mean it's impossible? Well, the conversation goes on. Maybe it shouldn't have. Maybe they should have stuck there and said, yeah, I guess there's something impossible here. Uh, and that's a thing you need to hold on to when you're reading this book, right? Have they, in this conversation, really taken seriously enough the weight of this putative impossibility? But in any case, they move on pretty quickly and with the conclusion that, well, you're just going to have to educate the person properly. And so that then becomes the, the question that drives the conversation from the end of book two, basically to the end of book seven of the Republic. Uh, the question is, how how should you educate a person so that that person would do, be good at taking up the role of guardian? Uh, but anyway, they, Glaucon and, and um, Socrates start off that conversation about educating the guardian, but then the, uh, Adamantus comes back in again, basically through a kind of interruption. At 376d, after Socrates and Glaucon have just been talking about this, uh, Socrates says... Um, and Glaucon's brother said, oh, I most certainly expect that this present consideration will contribute to that goal, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so Adamantus uh, jumped into the conversation that Socrates was having with Glaucon, and now he's going to take over the conversation after that. So Socrates says, uh, okay, come then, like men telling tales in the tale and at their leisure, let's educate the men in speech. So they talk about education, and Socrates says, well, what is, what is education? You know, is, is there a better one than that discovered over the great expanse of time, which is, of course, gymnastic for bodies and music for the soul? Uh, so, first of all, I, I want to say the thing he says here is very straightforward. He's saying, like, what are we talking about when we're talking about education? We're talking about the thing we know, right? Uh, but he specifically says, is it difficult to find a better one than that discovered over a great expanse of time? Like, you should notice both that that is kind of testament to the weight of a tradition like yeah people have been doing this for a long time and we figured something out so that's something you really got to take seriously right? when you're talking about education you're not just making something up on the spot you're you're thinking about something now that humanity has been doing for centuries maybe you could do it better or worse but the point is this is education itself is something that we've all inherited the very fact that there is education is something that we've inherited and so the issue is how to deal with that thing that is a reality in our lives only because of generations of people already doing this stuff, right? It's not something we're just conjuring up and inventing on the spot. Second thing you should notice, though, is, is of course, you might also say, well, it could be done better. So 
is, isn't it difficult to find a better one than that discovered over a great expanse of time? Well, yes and no. Uh, right, it is difficult in the sense that we're we're little tiny people uh, just noticing something that's this huge wave that's been you know going on for well millennia actually right but on the other hand that doesn't mean there's no reason to be critical about that and to to try to change it uh Adamantus doesn't say either of those things but anyway socrates raises that question and then he says okay so what's the more time about we're talking about gymnastic for bodies and music for the soul well you know again he's saying like we're talking about the stuff we know about like you're gonna uh, you're going to do phys ed, you know, you're going to learn how to strengthen your body, you're going to do all those sorts of things, and you're going to study the arts and so on. Like he's saying, like, this this is what you're talking about, right? You're talking about the ways we educate people. Uh, and so at a basic level, he's just getting Glau um, Adamantus into the conversation, right? And that they're going to pursue that for the next while. But again, I'd like you to think about a couple of things. Gymnastic for bodies and music for the soul. I just noticed that remark because, in fact, in book three, Socrates is going to say that gymnastic is not exactly for bodies. So it's worth uh, remembering that even though these things are said here and they're quickly taken on, uh, that doesn't mean there's no need to think about them. And they are going to be thought about more carefully later in various points, right? Uh, and second thing I want to say is gymnastic for bodies and music for the soul. That's what they're going to talk about. But I'll alert you to the fact that especially in uh, book seven, they're going to talk about the importance of mathematical education. And I wonder where that would fit, whether that is that part of gymnastic or music, or is it something different? Um, so hold on to that in your mind, too. But anyway, he's, it, Socrates is saying, OK, so let's start talking about education. So we're going to talk about this, the kind of thing we're already doing, right? And Adamantus says, right. And so Socrates says, OK. Um, and people are going to be educated in music before gymnastic, right? Like you're going to hear stories before you can go do phys ed. Like little children, you're going to read storybooks to them, etc., uh, etc., et right? And uh, uh, Adamantus says, of course. And Socrates says, okay, you ex include speeches in music, don't you? Um, and and uh, Adamantus says, yes. And so he says, speeches have a double form, the one true, the other false. Uh, must they be educated in both, but first in the false? And Adamantus says, I, I don't know what you mean. But, but in any case, Socrates is really just getting them to the point that they were already in in their earlier conversation. He's saying, look, children are going to be told tales before they're going to be handed arguments you know rigorous arguments about things in scientific prose right the way education begins is by you know children's stories you know watching in, in the modern day watching you know um, Peppa Pig on TV or something like that right you you uh, children are educated through fairy tales and comic books and their toys and all those sorts of things incidentally this is discussed uh, quite richly in the laws uh, there's a lot of talk about the distinctive educational needs of children and how they're different from the educational needs of older people. It's quite quite excellent. But anyway, the, Socrates is really getting you into thinking about childhood education, and they're, we're going to say education is not going to come from scientific textbooks. It's largely going to happen through the stories we're told. Well, that should connect with what we've already been noticing when we notice, for example, how Adamantus and Glaucon were educated. You know, they were reading the, the Victory Odes of Pindar. That's not what little kids read either. But, but it's continuous with that idea that you get educated through what you could broadly call sort of artistic culture, through dancing and singing and, uh, you know, hearing stories and all the rest, right? And, you know, to get different ones, age-appropriate ones. You get different ones at different ages, right? But, but Sargi says, oh, so, you know, in that sense, we're talking about stories that are in a significant sense false, in that they are not, you know, photographic reproductions of the world. They say there was this woman uh, named uh, Rapunzel and she had long hair or something like that. Well, there was no such person. You know, where they say there were these two kids, Hansel and Gretel. Well, there were no such people, right? So those stories are in a sense false, right? In a sense false. And of course, that's what we need to think about. How, how should you... Uh, respond to these stories to determine, let me put it the other way, in what sense they are true or not, or in what sense they are false. And I already read you some remarks from Socrates that pertain to that, and we've already seen quite a bit about how Adamantus thinks about that.
Uh, anyway, Socrates then says uh, at 377a to b, uh, don't you know that the beginning is the most important part of every work, and that this is especially so with anything young and tender, for at that stage it's most plastic, and each thing assimilates itself to the model whose stamp anyone wishes to give it. Well, now he, he's basically taking us right back into the conversation he already had with Adamantus that we already talked about. Because Adamantus said, well, what's the effect of, of these stories on the young when they hear them? So Sarge says, okay, let's think about that. So young people, they're open to all kinds of things. When you're born, it's not given who you're going to be. Uh, but you're going to take something on. You know, my son was born a few years ago and he speaks English now. He wasn't born speaking English. And if he'd grown up in uh, Mumbai, he would have grown up probably speaking Marathi. Uh, but if he'd grown up in Paris, he would have grown up speaking French, right? But he grew up speaking English uh, because that's the stamp that was put on him. But he could have been any of those things. He could have been any of them, but in fact, he becomes this one. Right? But then Socrates says, okay, so shall we so easily let the children hear just any tales fashioned by just anyone and take into their souls opinions for the most part opposite to those we'll suppose they must have when they are grown up. Well, let's take the second part first. You know, do we want children to take into their souls views that are opposed to the views they should have when they're grown up? I think the answer is presumably no. You know, that's kind of what you're thinking about with education. You're trying to get children to learn how, how to be good people, right? How to, how, in, in all kinds of ways. So, you want them to be taking in things that that are going to be the true views they're going to hold later, though so they're going to take them on in the children's form. Um, so I think there you might say no, you don't want them to take on opinions that are opposite to those ones they're going to have later. Um, but exactly how to compare the view a child has with the view that an adult has is, you know, no doubt a little bit difficult. But at some level, surely you can say no to that second thing. And what about the first part? Will we let them hear just any tales fashioned by just anyone? Well, I think again the answer is no. You want them to hear good things. But now I think, okay, where would you turn for tales that aren't just any old thing told by just anyone? I think, and I think Socrates thinks, well, you'd read Homer, and, or you'd read, uh, you know, Shakespeare or you'd read Paul's letters or whatever. I mean, kids wouldn't read Paul's letters, but I, I mean, I think we would commonly hold the view that we don't want tales told by just anyone. We want the accumulated and refined wisdom of the ages uh, as the roots by which people are going to learn. And that is certainly what education has been. Uh, we don't want to hear just tales told by anyone. Like some arbitrary person comes in and says, okay, you're going to tell them this tale now. You're going to tell them this tale now. I'm inclined to think, no, you don't want that. Uh, but if Adamantus is going to have exactly the opposite view. He's going to basically agree with Socrates, but I think what he's going to do is introduce instead, they should have just tales told by just anyone, or more exactly, they should have tales told by Adamantus, which I don't think is going to be very compelling. But in any case, uh, Adamantus says, in no event will we permit it. So, what you see here in that very strong statement, I think, is Adamantus not, first of all, thinking much about the subtlety of these remarks and what they might mean, which is what I think we as readers need to do, but instead very quickly jumping on that idea that, no, we're not going to let them take in bad stories, Like, and he's already told you what he thinks the bad stories are, and he's got a pretty strong, critical kind of censoring attitude. And so that's then what they're going to go on to do. And so from here... Uh, until early in book two, or sorry, early in book three, Adamantus is basically going to uh, remove all kinds of stories, uh, stories that are the backbone of education and were the backbone of his ed education, and uh, um, and it's going to reproduce exactly the views he already expressed at the beginning of book two. Um, I wonder uh, what Socrates would would. Uh, have said. I, I'm inclined to think the opposite. But in any case, um, uh, I want to draw your attention to a few particular passages in here. So, you know, they're going to say, okay, what are the kinds of falsehoods we don't want to present? And they say, you know, the big the big one that they say now, this is 377 between uh, B and 
E basically, they say, well, you don't want them to tell you a false thing about the ultimate nature of things, right? You don't want God or the gods to be presented the wrong way. So, so here's the going to be the worst kind of lie. Right? When a man in speech makes a bad representation of what gods and heroes are like, just as a painter who paints something that doesn't resemble the thing whose likeness he wished to paint, when that happens, that's the thing we're going to say is wrong, right? Natamantis says yes. Well, I'd like you to think about that. When a man in speech makes a bad representation of what gods and heroes are like, I wonder how you know what those ones are. Right? When he says, just as a painter who paints something that doesn't resemble the thing whose likeness he wished to paint, when he uses that as a comparison, you, can, you know what that's like, because you can see the person who's being painted, and you can see the painting, and you can say, that doesn't look like that person at all. Uh, but how does that compare with that other one? When a man in speech makes a bad representation of what gods and heroes are like, what is the access you have to the realities of gods and heroes that you're going to look to to say that's a bad representation right remember that thing that um adamantus said uh at the beginning of or in, in his earlier speech at the beginning of book two he said we know of them the gods uh or have heard of them from nowhere else than the laws and the poets who had given genealogies but I drew your attention to that passage before, right? There's something pretty uh, important about that idea that the the very nature of our knowledge of the gods is these sort of handed down stories of religion. Like, where else would you get it from? And so I wonder what you're supposed to look to to look at those things and say they got it wrong. Um, uh, well, I'll mention one possibility, again, of, of, a, of a relevant thing to consider, uh, again, from the Apology. You remember um, Socrates, uh, you know, uh, gets sentenced to death, and, then, and he says, you know, you might think why I'm not unhappy about this, and he says, you know, I'm not worried about this. And he says, 31c, um, the cause of this is what you have heard me speak of many times and in many places, that something divine or demonic comes to me, a voice um, da, 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 da. a sort of voice comes and whatever it comes it always turns me away from whatever I'm about to do but never turns me forward like, you know again very interesting passage where Socrates is talking about you know something like voice of conscience or something like that but and my point is only that that's one thing Socrates does identify as a kind of source of meaning that he names as d divine uh, that could be of some significance for, that you might turn to to say here's how i figure out what the gods are he also talks in a, in a very similar way of um poets as being inspired or being possessed by the gods so in, in all kinds of places socrates talks about divinity what, whatever that means as being something that is you know currently happening indeed even in book two uh when he first starts responding to glaucon and adamantus he says well something divine must have just happened so there are many remarks Socrates makes that make it seem like the divine is a kind of living presence and that there would be a certain way you, you could access it, you know, at least at the level of his language. So when I say, where else are you going to turn to? I'm not uh, trying to imply that there is nowhere else to turn to. There are some answers to that. But I also want to emphasize this other remark that Adamantus put in the voice of one of his speakers, that we don't know about these things from any place else other than the traditions that have been handed down. Um, even if the thing I've just said about Socrates' demonic voice suggests that, there, that that's not the only way you know about it, it remains a pretty powerful and important point that, uh, certainly in Adamantus' own voice, he wants to criticize something but it's not here that it's not clear that he has much else to turn to for his basis of that criticism than that very thing he's trying to criticize. So you need to think about that both both in, for the purpose of seeing whether Adamantus's argument and claims work, but also more importantly for the purpose of thinking about this real phenomenon. Right? I, th I mean, it seems to me the the Republic is very much about. The nature of the divine or the nature of the gods starts off with the religious festival uh, takes us into a sacrifice in Kephlis's house and then focuses immediately on stories about the gods and that's a very prominent part of this this really central discussion about the city and then about the education of the guardians uh, and uh, 
and I think you really need to be thinking about what are those stories about the gods and what is the divine and your your intelligent reflection on that needs to be the context in which you read these remarks in any case um, they they agree that they're not they don't want these stories to misrepresent the gods and of course we already know Adamantus thinks they really do but so Socrates then asks Adamantus who surely is as I just said an example of someone who is just anyone uh, fashioning tales uh, Socrates then asks Adamantus oh, okay so uh, what do you think the nature of God is right and, and Socrates says uh, God by, by God you mean the thing that's good right and Adamantus says yes and indeed that has been what's been on his mind since the beginning of the book right Glaucon and, the, and Adamantus both began by being concerned about the good as something that needs to be seen as intrinsically good rather than something that's just good for its consequences right and so that's what's on their mind and so Socrates says okay that's what we're talking about right when you're talking about the gods you want to say they're good right and Adamantus says yes and then Socrates says well but none of the good things is harmful is it and Adamantus says, not in my opinion, right? Okay, uh, what does Socrates think about that? Um, I don't think you would find it at all difficult to find Socrates saying all over the place that anything you could find that's good is also harmful. That's going to be a central theme in, his, in Socrates' own really powerful contribution in at the end of book five and throughout book six when he talks about the nature of the good and so on uh the the ambivalence of goods right that they're good in one sense but harmful in another sense is is at the center of what he's going to talk about so i don't think there's any doubt about what socrates opinion on that is and adamantus states the exact opposite opinion here and then they carry on with that right and socrates also says is the good you know god going to be the cause of anything harmful and Adamantus says no and so Socrates says well then the good is not the cause of everything right it's the cause of things that are in a good way but it's not responsible for the bad things and Adamantus says yes that's right well again as you will see when we get to book six uh, and seven and also as you would see from Socrates remarks in the Phaedo Socrates view on that is is the exact opposite right Socrates uh, Socrates says again his life has really been devoted to working with the idea that the good is the cause of everything right and trying trying to make sense of that uh, so here from 379b to uh, 379c basically uh, Adamantus uh, comes down very clearly on the side of a certain set of claims and those claims uh, determine all of the decisions he then wants to uh, endorse about getting rid of the traditional tales about the gods and coming up with new ones and those things he says those most important things it seems to me are very clearly the opposite of what socrates is fairly clearly on record as believing himself uh, and then they go on and uh so that's going to be their first law right you can't have stories about the god that present him as doing anything bad and so on uh, then they're going to have more about does the god ever appear in different forms does the god use lies and so on and again uh, adamantus is going to say absolutely not absolutely not so they're going to cut all that stuff out where once again I think Socrates basically tells you over and over again that that's exactly what the gods do indeed we've just been talking about the sort of riddling discourses of the oracle and so on right? the idea that the gods do present their meanings in disguise in a way uh, and indeed they they can say things that on the face of it look false almost look like a lie and yet you have to figure out how they're true uh, so Socrates has again built his life around a certain view about what the nature of divine uh, presentation or manifestation is but uh, Adamantus is going to assert the exact opposite and they're going to make that their law that nobody can ever present the god as communicating in in disguise or anything like that right so through the end of book two you get the continuation of the point of view that Adamantus brought to the table at the beginning of book two uh, and also then the way that conversation goes is Adamantus says well it's got to be like this God has to be understood this way the good has to be understood this way and he has his views and Socrates says okay so we're going to cut out all these stories right and he says some traditional things that are said some traditional things that are said so yeah what you see is 
stark opposition between the way traditional tales talk about these things and the way Adamantus talks about these things. Does that mean that those traditional tales are wrong? Or does that mean that Adamantus is wrong? So at the end of book two, they were discussing stories about the gods and Adamantus was telling you how he thought they should be corrected. Now, at the beginning of book three, they talk about stories about heroes and then very briefly stories about humans, regular people. Uh, so first of all, they, they say they want to uh, they want to portray heroes as courageous. So, of course, they're not going to portray Achilles as saying in the afterworld that uh, in Hades that uh, he'd rather be a serf, a slave to a serf than than be dead and so on. They take that stuff away. So again, Socrates brings out a long string of quotations uh, from poetry that there might be a lot to learn from. Uh, but uh, Adamantus is all he gets from them is that they have something in him he wants to get rid of. So they say they shouldn't tell scary stories about the bad things that are going to happen in the afterlife and so on, uh, because um, uh, perhaps they're good for something else. But we fear that our guardians, as a result of such shivers, will get hotter and softer than they ought. And Adamanta says, yes, and our fear is right. Um, so they have these stories they're going to take away because they don't want people to be afraid of death. Um, and so they're, they, because they're trying to educate their guardians to be courageous, they're going to respond to their fear that these stories might be dangerous. So it's, it seems like something is a little bit off there. Uh, then they go on and they say, uh, will we then take out the laments and wailings of famous men too? Um, they're going to take out the place where uh, Achilles cries over Patroclus and uh, Priam cries over Hector in the Iliad. Um, places where heroes demonstrate profound affection for their own, which you might recall was what you really wanted in a guardian, right? The problem with the guardians, as, as that was diagnosed in uh, Socrates' conversation with Glaucon in book two, was that you're going to make these people who are savage, who are great fighters, but they're not going to protect the people they're supposed to protect any more than they're going to protect the enemies, right? And so, that, so he says you're going to produce this class of people who, who you want to protect you, but they might just turn on you, right? So the question was, how are we going to cultivate in them a sense that they need to care for their own? And here, the very texts in which the great ruler Priam and the great soldier Achilles demonstrate their profound depths of care for their own, those very texts are the ones that they're going to remove because they don't want wailings and laments, right? Because they, they don't want their soldiers to have those kinds of feelings. So uh, Adamantus, it seems, is, contrary to what they need, designing the very thing they're afraid of. He's really showing you what you would do to design a warrior who is savage and heartless take away human feeling from that person take away care for your intimate companions that's what that's what he wants to do and so at 387c that's made really quite explicit uh, socrates says moreover we'll also say that such a man is most of all sufficient unto himself for living well and in contrast to others has least need of another yeah that's what you're doing you're making someone who thinks he doesn't need other people. Remember that the whole way Socrates' account of the city came into being was by him saying that it's because none of us is self-sufficient and we are so much in need of others. That's the very premise of human social existence, the very premise of the establishing of the human community as really the uh, environment that lets us fulfill our human nature. And here you're essentially designing someone who, as far as possible, is the very opposite of that. You're designing someone who has uh, shut off the things that, uh, that make him or her, as we will later see, human. Uh, so then they go on, right? The next one they're going to remove is laughter, right? Uh, you know, at 388E, so they shouldn't be lovers of laughter either. Uh, and they're going to, Adamantus says, yeah, that's right. Um, I'll couple that with saying you should notice in this text how often themes of laughter are, are raised. Uh, anyway, that really brings us to the end of the story about 
courage, which is really the issue that they introduced at the beginning of this discussion about the heroes and so on. Uh, they go on now to start talking about moderation. Shouldn't, shouldn't people also be moderate? Shouldn't they have sofrazune? And so they basically just introduced a new virtue, a new character trait that they're saying the well-developed guardian would have to have. I'm not going to go through that now. I, th I will probably refer to it again later when we go on to talk about the virtues. Um, but so I only want to talk about one other thing here now, uh, and that is the, the way this part of the conversation about stories and so on kind of ends. And that's where they say, okay, we've talked about the gods, we've talked about heroes, and now this 392a uh, isn't the thing we still have to talk about uh, human beings. And Socrates says, well, in fact, it looks like we can't uh, say that at, at the present moment. And uh, Adamantus says, why? And Socrates says, well, because that's exactly what we're studying in this book. We're studying, you know, what the just man, or in this conversation, we're studying what the just man is and how that's best to be understood and so on. So we don't yet have the model to turn to, to say, here's how these stories should be made. Uh, it's an interesting point for a lot of reasons. Um, but one is because it, it nicely reminds you of this issue I raised before that, you know, you need to have the model to know how you're going to talk about it, how, what, when you're talking about it in the right way. You need to hold that in connection with what they were saying about the gods. Um, and then I also wanted you to think uh, about the portrayal of the human being, not the hero and not the god, but just the regular human being as, as a just man. I want you to think about the notion of that as uh, a literary portrait. Like That's not what you're going to see in the Iliad. It's not what you're going to see in victory poetry of Pindar. It's not what you're going to see in tragedy. It's not what you're going to see in comedy. But again, what is the platonic literature about, if not that? And now they make they make a change because Socrates says like stories work in different ways than just plot and so they're going to talk about something like style or what I was calling genre from 392c to 398c they basically talk about a very particular issue of genre uh, and then Glaucon is going to come into the conversation and they're going to talk uh about music and so we'll leave that till later but I just want to say uh, one thing about this last bit when they talk about genre basically Socrates makes one big distinction he makes a distinction between that kind of literature or poetry that narrates in the third person and the kind that portrays direct speech dialogue the kind of thing you see in the platonic writings in other in other words he he's identifying that particular kind of writing in which the author doesn't speak in his or her own voice, but presents the character as saying the things. And the question is, should we allow that? The thing I want you to note there in relationship to our earlier conversation is that the genres that are distinctly about that, about portraying uh, characters speaking, are tragedy, comedy, and this unique new genre of the platonic dialogue uh, those are all the genres of the democratic city those are the genres of athens and the democracy in contrast to the genres of poetry that do not do that the victory odes of of uh, pindar and so on uh, and homer at a basic level really there are these kinds of non-dramatic kind of narrative poetry and these kinds of dramatic poetry. And in a pretty, pretty significant way, that's the distinction between the old and the aristocratic and the new and the democratic. And so it's interesting then, or striking, that Adamantus ends up uh, following the same kind of reasoning he's been following all along, saying, yeah, we're not going to allow those, what they translate here as imitative forms of poetry in. Uh, so th that's the conclusion they get to at 398a, where uh, um, Socrates, you know, speaking about, about that point of view, says, okay, so if a man who is able by wisdom to become every sort of thing and to imitate all things should come to our city, making uh, wishing to make a display of himself and his poems, 
Uh, we'd fall on our knees before him as a man sacred, wonderful, and pleasing. But we'd say that there is no such mon man among us in the city, nor is it lawful for such a man to be born there, and we would send him away to another city. Right. So I guess one of the things that I'm trying to stress then is the importance of you, me, as a reader, thinking through the weight of these exclusions imitative poetry dramatic poetry laughter crying and uh, feelings of compassion for those who are our own uh, in intimate companions and family members uh, and indeed the uh, the whole world of traditional stories and traditional poems um, Socrates gives us tons of material. Plato gives us tons of material for thinking about those things well. And that's what we need to be doing as we're engaging with the argument that is being developed uh, basically by Adamantus in conversation with Socrates uh, about those things. And we need to be seeing the kind of person that's produced by, the, by what Adamantus is, um, is imagining and how that relates to the problem that set this whole thing up.